Welcome. I'm Gina Ray Foster, Director of the John Jay Teaching and Learning Center, and I am delighted to open our equity, accessibility, and artificial intelligence and global education panel discussion for you this afternoon. This event is the brainchild of Dr. Marie Michelle Straw, our John Jay Teaching and Learning Center online faculty fellow. We'll learn more about Michelle in just a moment and is co-sponsored by the Center for International Human Rights under the direction of George Andriopoulos. Would you be so kind as to keep yourselves on mute unless invited to speak? Please use the chat to post questions for our panelists. We'll be tracking and sharing these for the Q&A after the main discussion. To keep things a bit smoother, we will not be entertaining questions during the discussion, but we'll ha be happy to collect those and remind everyone of what they wanted to ask. We are recording and we are enabling the live transcript. You can find the transcript on the toolbar at the bottom of your screen where the double C in live transcript words appear. The transcript will be saved along with the recording if you want to review these at a later time. Also, I invite anyone who has not done so already to rename themselves with their personal pronouns as we find this is respectful for our students and our larger community. It is a pleasure to introduce our panelists and moderator today. Michelle, Marie Michelle Straw is the online faculty fellow for the current academic year in the Teaching and Learning Center in the Office of Institutional Effectiveness at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. She is also an adjunct professor in the International Criminal Justice Master's and Bachelor's programs and a visiting scholar at the Center for International Human Rights, specializing in artificial intelligence. She recently won the Faculty Digital Innovation Award at John Jay College and is a refugee from Silicon Valley. She has recently won another award just this week, but we're not telling you, you will have to check your social media next week and learn the good news. But let's just say Michelle is pretty special and we are lucky to have her. Her specialties include online extremism, cybercrime, disinformation, and terrorist finance. She navigates the physical and digital world as a veteran with severe disabilities. Maria Victoria Perez Rios Victoria holds a doctorate in political science from the Graduate Center at CUNY and a law degree from the Law School of Zaragoza, Spain. Currently, Perez Rios teaches, among other courses, international human rights and comparative criminal justice systems as an adjunct assistant professor in the Department of Political Science and the ICJMA program at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Her research interests include international human rights law, accountability, counterterrorism, and civil rights. She is the author of Divided We Stand, American and European Perspectives in the Fight Against Transnational Terrorism, a chapter in International Criminal Justice, Legal and Theoretical Perspectives. And since fall 2019, Perez Rios is the academic advisor of John Jay's multi-awarded Model UN Nations team. Last but not least, she is the designer of a pilot workshop on college education for people with disabilities as part of John Jay's DEI Professional Development Initiative. Antonia Levy, Antonia, is an East German transplant to New York and is currently the Associate Director of Faculty Development in Instructional Technology at CUNY School of Professional Studies. She also teaches as an adjunct instructor in the sociology program at the school. Working in faculty development and instructional technology, she is dedicated to the implementation of universal design as part of the struggle for more equality in higher education. Vanessa Spina, Vanessa, has several areas of study. These include international criminal justice and dispute resolution with minors in sociology and environmental justice. She participates in the International Criminal Justice Club at John Jay, as well as being a member of the National Society of Leadership and Success. As part of the John Jay community, she has always felt welcomed and treated as an equal, even though she is someone who has lived her life with a learning disability. Vanessa has refused to let the challenges of online learning stop her from achieving her goals. And with that, our moderator, Michelle, is going to launch the discussion. 
Thank you very much, Gina. And thank you to our esteemed panelists. It's really an honor to, to have you here. And, and it's really an honor for us to come together and discuss um, this topic um, on, you know, and, and our focus on disability and design justice, which actually doesn't get as much attention as it really should. And so I'm really proud of this group um, with uh, bringing together our knowledge on this. So I, I'm just gonna focus, kind of bring some context um, to why we're discussing this now and what's going on um, in, in the larger world. And then um, we'll be guiding our panel experts um, as they share their expertise. So recently, multiple United Nations declarations and resolutions have highlighted the urgency with which we need to address artificial intelligence as a human rights problem. This includes the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights calling for a moratorium in September 2021 on the use of facial recognition in critical sectors such as criminal justice, healthcare, and education, and the resolution on AI and ethics signed by all 193 member states of UNESCO in November 2021. For those of you who work um, in the field of international law, you know that a unanimous resolution is like almost never happens, right? So that's a big deal. Um, currently, um, so this is happening concurrent with, with our presentation, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities has prepared a report on AI and persons with disabilities, which is currently under discussion at the Human Rights Council um, at the UN here in New York. Uh, in recent years, multiple um, NGOs, academics, and think tanks have recommended a virtual pumping of the brakes, so to speak, on deployment of artificial intelligence, which has been pushed largely by corporations who are coming at this with techno-utopian goals in, without any internationally agreed upon ethical frameworks to safeguard human rights and prevent discrimination in terms of gender, race, ethnicity, and our topic here, disability. Largely left out of design decisions and design choices are the users themselves, creating uh, dystopian scenarios downstream for students and faculty with disabilities, especially given the rapid, online, uh, rapid adoption of online learning in many Western countries due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So to say that this topic is of, of you know, being discussed at the highest levels of the international community is an understatement. Um, so to our first question, the United States, um, where all, you know, um, a lot of us here, well, all of us here on the panel are, despite our AI backgrounds, um, the United States has one of the most robust set of legal protections for persons with disabilities globally, as enshrined within the Americans with Disabilities Act the Rehabilitation Act, and the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. But this often gets discussed only in terms of compliance and checklists and kind of a check the block. For our purposes today, I'd like to invite Victoria to speak about um, the disability and human rights angle at, you know, in terms of international law at the global level to help further orient us um, so, Victoria, can you speak to um, disability in the context of human rights globally, and how has this concept um, shifted from what was previously mostly a medical deficit model to one of economic, social, and political rights? Okay. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, thank you, Gina, for the introductions, and thank you for my co-panelists. Uh, Vanessa and Antonia, and also to everybody that is here today to, um, you know, share uh, our thoughts on uh, people with disabilities and AI. I'm going to uh, try to answer your question, Michelle, by doing first a quick uh, background on human rights at the UN, uh, just in case. I mean, usually, uh, we all think that everybody knows what we know, like the basics of what we are talking about. And just in case, just really quickly, the um, international human rights law uh, has certain characteristics and those characteristics, some of them that I find important for today to sum up would be that they are interrelated, uh, they are um, indivisible, they are for everybody, and they are also an obligation 
of the state, the state meaning independent countries. So they are interrelated and indivisible, meaning that we cannot think of a person just having civil political rights, but we need to understand that a person has civil political rights, but they also have socioeconomic, cultural rights that they're all interrelated with each other. On top of that, we have something that is called solidarity rights, which I'm not going to get into because it's also problematic at the international uh, level. If we talk about people with disabilities, we have to keep in mind the that uh, well, they are persons, so why do we need a specific uh, conventions or Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which is from 2006? Well, we need it because uh, in, the, um, in the human rights uh, system framework, what we have are uh, what are called the International Bill of Rights, which is based on the American and before that, the English Bill of Rights. We have a declaration, which is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights from 1948, that has more or less most of the standards and rights that we can think of. They are missing some, but because it's from 1948. So there are some things that they didn't talk about in those days. But for the most part, it has also the principle of non-discrimination. And I know that it's called equity. I usually call it uh, equality at the international level. It's called equality, uh, what's called substantial equality. But equity, we can talk about that, is part of the system. But declarations have no legal effects. So we needed two uh, international covenants or conventions or treaties. You can call them whatever you want to. They are all treaties at the end of the day one on civil and political rights and another one on econ socio economic, social and cultural rights. They were adopted in 1966 and entered into force in 1976. Since that day, again, it should have applied to everybody, but they had to, um, to find out ways of trying to have treaties that would respect or remind states that they have to respect the rights of especially protected categories of people. That's why we have a specific convention on the rights of women, another one on the rights of, of children, uh, another one on migrant workers and their families. And then in 2006, we finally get one for people with disabilities. What is important of this new model, even though the US is not party to it, is that they are focusing more on um, Yes, they talk about accessibility, but they also talk about universal design. They don't see any more uh, person with disabilities as a medical condition, but they see it as uh, not the person has to adapt to the environment, but the environment has to adapt to the person, meaning that we have to remove whatever uh, obstacles are out there. Are we going to get 100% of that? Probably never, but we have to try to improve on that record. And this is what we are going to try to discuss today. I also want to, because I can go talking about this, but we'll talk about it later if you want to know more details, that I want to also emphasize that the United Nations is not, the main goal is not human rights. The main goal is maintaining international peace and security. Uh, human rights is a very tertiary, so to speak, goal, secondary, will be even giving it too much importance, but it's the place where we discuss internationally, where we set standards. And that's why that convention, even though we are not party to it, it also helps uh, groups of people with disabilities in the US to understand that another model is possible. And I wanted to continue, I mean, I don't want to disparage against uh, the US in the sense that what has happened is that because we had systems of protection maybe earlier on, on in time, uh, some of them are not up to date with the new, what we want now. So we may find, I mean, I'm thinking of when I was looking at the background for, for this um, presentation, in the US already in the 1960s, there is an important, um, are already groups that they don't only want uh, accessibility, they are also demanding the, creeping of everything, like meaning that um, getting away from that model of medical, um, the medical, you know, perfection, ableism, whatever people consider the standards that in a way marginalize for so many decades, uh, people with disabilities. And just before I, um, if um, the rapporteur is a very important uh, figure uh, within the UN because especially the rapporteur, we have the second rapporteur, uh, his Gerard Quinn, and uh, first the, the first rapporteur was a Chilean woman, and she was a person with disabilities herself, and she was the leader of groups of people with disabilities. And what is important of them is that 
they are working for the Human Rights Council, and it's a way of uh, prodding states to behave according to international standards. And the mandate of the um, of the rapporteur includes directly to recognize, promote, implement, and monitor um, human rights as they um, affect people with disabilities. So they can even do visits, but it's always depending to the country, but it all depends on the, the state allowing them to go uh, to those uh, for the visits. Everything in the human rights system depends from uh, the government. So the UN is not in that sense, cannot do their own thing. If there's going to be implementation, it has to go through the states. I just wanted to emphasize that. And then I will talk specifically so other people have the chance on um, specifics about um, AI and people with disabilities to continue the conversation. If that's okay. Oh yeah, thank you so much, Victoria, for, for, for that context. And so for the attendees, um, I put some references um, in the chat to some of the treaties and conventions that um, Victoria was referring to, if you're interested in looking at this. And I really appreciate how you put this into context, right? And the focus on inclusion and mainstreaming of people with disabilities um, and the elimination of the various barriers um, in products, environments, programs, services, um, and, and this includes barriers that can be brought um, to play by technology um, and, and specifically AI. And in, and in, the, in the special rapporteur's report that is currently being discussed, um, you know, he notes that persons with disabilities are more vulnerable globally um, because of climate change, pandemics, um, you know, since COVID-19, employment barriers and discrimination, um, especially at the, con you know, when we look at the intersection of race, gender, culture, other power dynamics, in addition to um, um, disability. That being said, we also know that um, artificial intelligence has, you know, and other technologies and big data have act, you know, have also been enablers in, in some cases. Um, and so I'd like to turn the conversation over to Vanessa. Welcome, Vanessa. Thank you for being here. Um, could you for uh, take a few moments and talk to us from your perspective um, about some of the challenges that are faced by students with disabilities in the face of online learning? And then conversely, what are some of the ways digital classrooms have been enabling for you. Okay, good uh, Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so um, I think um, some challenges students really face, um, especially during the pandemic, uh, was the transition um, from in-person to online learning. Because um, particularly for me, um, before the whole transition, I was not the type of person um, to see myself taking an online class. So I think just like establishing like a schedule uh, for myself, especially being at home, um, found it more difficult. Um, but since then I've been able to adapt, thankfully. Um, and, sorry. Um, and also um, doing um, this uh, online learning. Um, I find that, you know, um, Professors have been, um, they more like to lecture um, about uh, the topics that are in class rather than uh, providing like visual aids. So it kind of like loses um, at least my attention sometimes and I'm sure other students as well. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's oftentimes uh, difficult to focus on the given lecture. Um, but I think the digital classroom can be enabling because, um, you know, you have more of a flexible schedule than uh, compared to being in person where you have to be on campus at a specific time. So remote learning is definitely, um, it's great for a flexible schedule. Um, and for me, you know, I'm remote for both school and work. So it gives me the opportunity to manage my time better. Um, and I think that also like uh, online learning has, out, has helped me with um, my anxiety in the classroom because in uh, in-person learning um, is definitely uh, sometimes challenging, 
Um, so I think that um, being remote has made me more, um, I guess, like confident. Um, and that's concluding uh, my section. Thank you so much, Vanessa. I really appreciate um, your bearing witness to both the, the pros and the cons and, and highlighting some of the invisible disabilities that can, you know, that can come to bear, you know, because sometimes, you know, one aspect of ableism, for example, is assuming that everyone with a disability has a very visible physical disability. You know, we use wheelchair icons um, and it can be challenging for those of us with invisible disabilities, you know, as Vanessa pointed out, you know, there can be issues with, um, you know, adapting to a digital environment in terms of organization, executive functioning, you know, and, and even the presentation of the materials um, without, uh, you know, not using multiple modes that can actually affect a person's perception. And I know as a person with vision difficulties, that affects me. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, Antonia, I'd like to turn it over to you because you're coming at this from uh, you know, a different perspective as, as faculty, as well as, um, you know, a, an expert in teaching and learning from the faculty, um, or actually from the perspective of, of CUNY School of Professional Studies, and you guys are actually award-winning um, nationwide, so you, know, you, you guys know how to do this, right, so congratulations, first of all, to your, your continued awards in this, but what do you see as best practices in accommodating disabilities in online education? Um, and, and what are some of the biggest challenges conversely that you see in this? Mm -hmm. So thank you also, thank you for inviting me on this panel and uh, thank you for my co-presenters uh, for being here. I'm really uh, appreciating this. So, um, you know, listening to uh, Vanessa, I, I was thinking actually that, uh, as you mentioned, Michelle, our school is mostly online. So we are, we call ourselves an almost online, you know, uh, school. So even before the pandemic, we created mostly courses on Blackboard, mostly, <laughs> that, are, that are fully online. But um, I think that is a very different uh, experience than most students and faculty had during the pandemic, because, um, you know, trying to get this fast uh, transition from face-to-face -face, uh, in-person instruction to being remote uh, resulted often in what we call, <laughs> in technical terms, a remote synchronous uh, kind of teaching mode. And I think, Vanessa, this is especially what you were referring to of having to listen to someone, you know, for 45 minutes uh, lecturing uh, as a talking head, most probably on your screen um, is, is obviously not the most, um, how should I say, um, the best way of, uh, of, of teaching. Um, and so one of the challenges I actually see, as you asked about challenges, um, in online education or in online or hybrid education is um, that you know the screen does create distance even if we are on camera right most people don't feel the same type of connection that they feel being in a classroom the other thing and uh, you know being here in the zoom meeting and the recording is on um you know there is also a kind of uh, uh, consideration of how much of this um, is actually private, right? And in the classroom, and how much of this is, is more permanent. And uh, so that creates other considerations for our faculty and students to consider. So, um, um, one not, you know, what, what are best practices in online education? So, um, first of all, <clears throat> is uh, what we emphasize is that you proactively try to create a, a teaching experience, a learning experience that tries to consider all kinds of students. And I'm not just talking about students with disabilities because that can be a certain challenge and I can talk about this in a second, uh, you know, talking about considering accommodations and things like that, but also just consider the diversity of students in your classroom, right? Where are they coming from? What is their background? How they are approaching learning? All these things, right? So um, we often use universal design for learning principles, UDL principles, um, when teaching our faculty of how to create their teaching and learning experiences. So um, 
part of that, for example, is that you don't include videos that are longer than to six to 10 minutes, let's say. <laughs> so you don't have this you know, talking head on your screen for 45 minutes because Again, um, uh, studies have shown that any any student's attention drifts away after that time. You know, you start opening other up other YouTube videos <laughs> and things like that. So um, um, that you know, that's just one best practice. But um, what we are trying to emphasize is that you do this proactively, so that you don't have to reactively when someone comes in. Who, for example, you know, Michelle, you mentioned. Um, um, visual impairments, right? Someone comes in and you have all these graphs in your in your class without any alt text added to it, right? And suddenly you have to scramble to make them accessible. So um, why not add alt text um, automatic, uh, uh, not automatically, um, proactively to all your graphs so you don't have to accommodate someone who comes in who needs these kind of um, and I also um, tell our faculty um, two things. One, it's not, I know it sounds challenging and many people feel, you know, a little hesitant approaching this topic because it seems so daunting at times to um, make your class accessible. Um, it's a process, right? It's a process and you do it in steps. You can't do it all. And I, Vanessa, I like what you said uh, that, you know, will we, we will ever have a hundred percent accessibility? Um, you know, I, I don't know, but I know that we don't have it right now and we have to kind of work with that and, you know, um, be kind and patient with each other. So that's one thing. And the other um, uh, is uh, it's not rocket science. You know, it's not something that like you can't do. It's it's um, there are steps you can take and things you can change to make it more accessible and uh, uh, available to more um to diversity of students um in your in your classes and i just want to mention is there has been a series of events at puny recently about they call it a pedagogy of kindness and you know it, there's a lot of different topics assembled under this but i really like that term because it really makes you approach teaching with a kind spirit right you're not approaching your students as like in a punitive way right away. You're coming in as a kind teacher and trying to really work with students. So um, I, I just wanted to mention that this is a new term and I, I really like it and would like it to spread more as a as an approach to teaching. Uh, Michelle, uh, let me know if I covered everything that in your question. <laughs> yeah, that's great. So what I did um, is I put in the chat um, um, Antonia referenced the Universal Design for Learning Standards, the UDL um, standards, and I have the link for that for those in the chat. We actually use that in our faculty seminars extensively at the Teaching and Learning Center here at John Jay. Um, we do have a year-long program um, that it also addresses um, accessibility and inclusion in online learning, referencing um, this framework and guidelines, and some of it um, you know, I, I want to emphasize is it, it really is about planning for alternatives and not trying to make everything a one size fits all, right? So um, having multiple modes, multimedia, so students can access the information in, in the way that is best for them, right? So um, it, it really is a, a different philosophy, but I, I highly recommend um, looking at that resource um, as a guide. So thank you, um, Antonia. Um, Victoria, I want to um, turn it back to you for a few minutes um, because, you know, as we're talking about online education, it isn't only about the pedagogy. There's a there's actually a growing um, digital divide in global education, um, and I think that you know we need to address some of the factors behind that. So, um, I'd like to hear from you a little bit on that. Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, Michelle. Um, I was. Um, looking at some of the data that I went over and I shared with you in the Google Docs and basically what they're finding out is that uh, around, the, I mean, in the US, we can say on average, we are doing quite well, but 
you know, we are a developed country. We are on the top, you know, countries of the of the world. If we talk about GDP per capita, so in in GDP in general, we are number one. But what I mean is that uh, per capita, and we still have some divides. But uh, at the international, if we look globally, we are talking um, up to the number of almost like three quarters of people don't having uh, children, not having quite good access to uh, remote means, uh, internet, stuff like that. The same goes for uh, young people. So internationally, anybody under 18, it happens in the US too, are considered children. Then 18 to 24 would be still young people. I know that most of us, we want to believe we are young until, you know, until we are in our 60s, but, you know, <laughs> basically young people, like that definition of really young, then supposed to be adults. So it's, it's amazing that that's the number because the, the issue is that we always think about education because that's what we do, but what about employment opportunities? I mean, just focusing on the, and this is from the, the UNESCO and also the World, World Telecommunications Organization, that they know the data. I mean, they know how bad infrastructure is around the world. And uh, so we are going again with... Um, talking about issues that if a person uh, has disabilities in many countries around the, the world, uh, young children with disabilities, they are not going to get an education. It's very difficult for them. Parents are not going to spend money on the child going to a school. They may not even be registered. Uh, they may not even have a birth certificate. Uh, there are many things that make their life really difficult. If for, I mean, if, if they have the chance that at least they can go to the local school, now with COVID, that was not, the, that was not happening. So it's kind of a very big issue that uh, we are investing, we are talking about um, IA here, but in some countries, uh, the major issue is that uh, children don't have access to basic internet, like some hours a day, so they can do their homework and learn and then be productive members of society. And then if they are young, so usually in many countries, uh, by the time you are for even earlier than that, uh, children go to work. It's something that is established that, you know, you get your education and you go to work. And uh, a lot of the employment, good employment, you, are, you need uh, to have access to digital uh, platforms. You have to be trained. Otherwise, you are already, I mean, you are losing a lot of, of uh, opportunities. And who's going to, uh, to fill out those opportunities? People from the developed countries. If you are developed, and a country in, in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America, they need people that are proficient in using uh, digital uh, media. They're going to hire from abroad and their children are behind and young uh, children. When I saw this, I didn't know it was that bad. I mean, we are talking, I mean, it's a massive how bad the, I mean, there are problems in, don't get me, you know, like it's only globally. Of course, there are problems in the U.S., but the divide, if we look at it from uh, developed countries and developing, is staggering. I mean, we are, uh, people are now talking about uh, how to decolonize everything, and you're like, well, maybe we should start by trying to get them a good infrastructure uh, so they can, you know, have access to um, digital uh, information. I mean, it's one of our duties as developed countries, something that is not usually mentioned when we talk about rights, and it's not just economic development, is that we're supposed to share uh, any any scientific developments with uh, countries that are less, uh, you know, technologically advanced. And it's not, uh, it's considered a right. It's in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It's part of UNESCO also what they try to do. We are not uh, doing, and I'm just thinking of, uh, as uh, Michelle mentioned, and I think has been mentioned here, even not by name, but Michelle, you mentioned intersectionality. So imagine intersectionality exploding, like basically a person with disability that is female, a person of color, poor, and in a third world country. I mean, what access do they have to, I just. Absolutely. And I like, thank you so much, Victoria, for that, for bringing that that global perspective. We know we have digital divides within the United States and they're actually, you know, very cleanly along racial lines. You know, we know that uh, black communities, um, you know, and um, geographies within the United States are especially disadvantaged with broadband access as well as rural communities. But when we, you know, look at the 50,000 foot view, it gets even worse. And, I, and I, it, this has been called a digital canyon um, and and I, I totally agree with that. I wanna move us on to the next question. Um, and 
um, get us, you know, focus a little bit more um, um, specifically on artificial intelligence in, in, this, in the spectrum of um, the digital world. And the special rapporteur's report calls out specifically as problematic facial recognition technologies, emotion recognition technologies, the replacement of human carers and educators by chatbots and robots, and extreme surveillance and privacy risks that artificial intelligence and its underlying data sets um, present particular problems for people with disabilities. I mean, they can be particularly problematic, you know, in, in an intersectional way. But um, so as by way of example, a few weeks ago, there was a report that George Washington University in, in the United States had to walk back a proposed surveillance project that was initiated by their operations and facilities uh, department that would have worked with Cisco to collect student location data based on Wi-Fi access to assess density and usage of different campus facilities. So there was a logic to this and it was largely driven by their corporate partner, by the way. However, nobody stopped to think, right? And this is that proactive planning that Antonia mentioned earlier, um, how this would adversely impact student privacy and would have been especially detrimental to students who were accessing disability you know, and psychology services on campus, which they believed was private access and it's confidential. However, their location and thus the confidentiality would have been compromised with this proposed study because it would have been generated as data exhaust. So even though it didn't intend to surveil disabled students, that became part of, of the data exhaust. So the, uh, the incoming um, interim president, um, when, he, when he, this landed on his desk, he immediately pulled it back, thank goodness. Um, and he noted that just because technically we can do that, right? Like it's a technical possibility because of their, their Cisco network doesn't actually mean that we should. So now with that kind of focus, I'd like to invite the panelists to comment on one or more of those specific technologies um, that were highlighted by the special rapporteur um, and, and talk about, you know, some of the problems, but also alternate, you know, some of the alternatives um, and options. So Vanessa, um, as a, a student with disabilities, um, I would like to invite you to speak a little bit um, about some of these technologies. I think you were going to um, um, talk about some of, um, you know, the chat bots and, and as a possibility or um, accommodating, you know, accommodations with your IEP. Yes, okay. Um, so just to give a little background on my uh, specific disability. Um, so I'm dyslexic and I also have uh, astigmatism. Um, so keeping this in mind, um, for me um, as a student, um, I've always heard the phrase like, you don't have a disability, why do you get extra time on your exam? Um, and this you know, brings to mind that you know, uh, people, uh, who are disabled don't have to look a specific specific way to be acceptable to the average person. Um, and ableism can be things like not following an IEP uh, or any other disability accommodations. Um, so like recently, um, I had taken a quiz online and uh, you know, I'm required to get extra time and all my professors, they get emails about uh, my IEP and my accommodations. Uh, and my IEP wasn't honored for that quiz, which, you know, sent me into a bit of a panic. Um, but, um, you know, just things like that can, uh, can really make a difference to a student. Um, but one way to help dismantle uh, ableism um, is using, like my previous example with the quiz, um, communicating with professors and reminding of any accommodations, even though it can be annoying. Um, now moving on to how chatbots can be problematic. Um, you know, you encounter chatbots um, almost just about anything you try to get in contact with, either a bank, a school, a doctor's office. Um, you know, they're frustrating to begin with. Um, 
at a customer service uh, setting. Um, so they actually, you know, they delay um, your valuable time from talking to a live person, um, which if you would have talked to a live person from the start, you wouldn't have to waste all this time. Um, but, you know, chatbots are helpful for basic functions. So um, in my the job I'm currently working at as a personal assistant uh, for a real estate agent, you know, I use chatbots to help me post listings online, but for very basic functions, nothing like specific, very basic, and it works for that. Um, but, you know, in the case of uh, an academic level, it's not helpful. Um, so, you know, um, in addition, uh, chatbots can help you, uh, can point students to like websites, but they don't help students with indiv individualized help. Um, so for example, if you have like a personal matter that needs to be addressed by the professor, you know, how is the chatbot really gonna respond? Like you send an email and they're like, oh, our class is this time from this day. And, you know, it doesn't get to the source of your problem. Um, so if you're not understanding an assignment, or things like that. Uh, you need that one-on-one -on -one conversation with your professor. Um, and as a college student, um, you need someone to understand the context, whether it be like a family matter, or disability or whatever. And chatbots, you know, they don't have the emotion or the thinking ability to assess your needs. And this is important to note because chatbots won't be able to respond according to those needs. Um, and to conclude my portion, um, there's already enough fake news in the world being spread by chatbots and we don't need them in the classroom. Thank you so much, Vanessa. That was extremely insightful. And I just want um, everyone, I want to give a shout out to Vanessa because she um, took my um, special topic seminar in fake news and cybercrime um, and is actually an expert in uh, chatbots um, and hacktivism, by the way. So a uh, shout out to that. Um, I want to highlight a few things, um, you know, Vanessa did an excellent job at highlighting the disability tax that students face, um, you know, when their accommodations are not honored, constantly having to remind, um, you know, people, you know, their professors of their needs, it creates both an administrative and emotional burden, which is actually completely contrary to the, the inclusion goals that Victoria laid out, um, you know, in the beginning of our panels. Um, so not only the disability tax, um, you know, she also highlighted something that's very important is, you know, chatbots and a lot of other AI technologies that are being pushed by corporations do so with the, they do the, the corporations push some of this with the mistaken assumptions that professors are just there to push content. Like, like we're just create, you know, we're just pushing content out to students and completely neglect the fact that a classroom is actually a very interactive relationship built environment, not only from the professor to the students, but in peer learning. So, you know, in my mind, it's completely missed the mark. And I love how you highlighted, Vanessa, that, you know, this is cookie cutter stuff that's great for, you know, a cookie cutter answer, but it, you know, cannot provide and misses the relationship portion. On that note, um, um, Antonia, um, I wanna kind of turn it over to you now to talk about um, some of the challenges and opportunities um, that artificial intelligence can provide. And I know you have some thoughts on the, you know, the jumping on the shiny object problem that we face in the academy. Okay, thank you, um, Michelle, and thank you, Vanessa, for setting us up so well. <laughs> um, yes, I agree. So um, there is a tendency, you know, in education to, uh, you know, kind of uh, take on the the next uh, uh, shiny technology and you know implement it, and um, sometimes you know what's what's not considered is how that affects different kind of students right and even uh, instructors I want to say as well <laughs> you know um, you need proper training and you you need to understand the tool before you should uh, implement it so uh, that said um, there are obviously tech there's obviously technology especially in online education that can be very useful right so um, one of the um, 
things that I emphasize um, when I, you know, work with faculty is first of all, check with your school if this is an, a supported tool, not just for faculty, but also for students, right? Is there any kind of support if a student has a question? Because also the instructors might not be the ones that, you know, can answer all the questions. Um, I want to I want to just mention VoiceThread as one of the tools that we have adopted at our school. Um, they have actually done, I'm, you know, I want to mention a good example here. They have done a pretty good job of trying to be their very um, uh, visual tool, and they have been really trying to do well to uh, make this accessible to also students with or people with uh, visual impairments. Um, so, and they have also reached out to the community uh, to get feedback and 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 uh, you know implement. It's not perfect, uh, of course. <laughs> I don't know which tool is, but um, uh, you know they are constantly trying to improve. Um, so, uh, you know, it should be something that is vetted by the community, by students, by faculty before it is implemented. And um, the other thing that I emphasize with faculty is give options if possible, right? So there are different preferences and, you know, it's not, um, you know, uh, one size doesn't fit all. And just because you as an instructor, you have learned it this way, mostly through lectures, <laughs> it doesn't mean that this is the best way of teaching a topic right so um you know are there other ways to to um present a topic to make it interesting to make it approachable right um Vanessa, you mentioned you know your attention I, I agree my attention span is also very short so i love graphs i love like you know visual like <laughs> and but for some other students that is really distracting right so, you know, how do you work with this? And so um, if there is any way that, uh, you know, you can give options um, that, that you know, obviously have the same quality that, that, that kind of um, uh, uh, also gear towards your learning goals, because, you know, one of the uh, baselines is always the quality of education. You, it's not about, um, you know, lowering the quality or lowering the uh, expectations. It's about making it more accessible, approachable for more people, right? So that is that is um, the kind of goal. And then I agree here that you know some of what is being promoted with AI is very um, you know it sounds exciting and you know you want to try it out and like <laughs> see how it goes, but um, it might really not be. Uh, education might not be the first that should try this out, okay? Because, um, you know, uh, there are accessibility concerns, uh, you know, and in all, in all kinds of ways. And um, it needs to, you know, we need more experience with it and we need different uh, users to try it out, right? And give feedback before oh. this becomes a large scale. Uh, and, also, we all know companies and you know corporations are all about efficiency, and efficiency is surely not the term for education. I feel. <laughs> um, so, uh, so yeah, I, I see I, you, Michelle. You you want to say something? No, no, no. Sorry, I'm just. I just want to make sure that we're we're kind of on um, on time because um, I want to you know be able to open it up to the audience. But I know also, Antonio. One thing that um, we had discussed in a different setting was. You know, right now the latest shiny object is virtual reality and you know, quote unquote, immersive learning. You know, and we get like, there's all sorts of excitement about that, but there's certainly, um, you know, not just disability, um, you know, or accessibility issues. You know, in terms of visual um, impairments, vestibular impairments. You know, mm -hmm. like oh my god, I can't, yeah, I can't even yeah. imagine putting like you know, a, VR you know headset the reality on. goggles yeah. on my face, right? Like I can't, I, I'm wobbly on a good day, you know, <laughs> I can't even imagine that. Um, not to mention the cost hardware learning curve, but I, you know, I think one option, as you said, I, you know, I love your proactive and measured approach that you're advocating. And this also, you know, is something that, um, you know, comes up with, you know, the, the UDL guidelines are a really great way to remind ourselves of this. But, you know, one option could be, for example, for newer technologies, you know, for faculty to try it out as an extra credit, for example, or something that is low stakes, as opposed to putting all sorts of high stakes stress on a student that it's graded, right, or make it optional, 
you know, to find ways, um, you know, but certainly not jumping on the shiny object. Your, your advocacy for measured planned approaches and user testing, right? And also be, you know, we have to be aware that, you know, the corporate speak that comes into this, right? Is they're pushing efficiency, which can sound sexy, right? <laughs> like it sounds like there's a, you know, but the work that we do in the academy isn't necessarily, doesn't necessarily have the same metrics. So that is fantastic. I do want to kind of bring us towards the end of our panel discussion. We have so much more to discuss and that we'll bring it up during the questions, but I want to kind of close ourselves out. Um, I'm going to ask each of the panelists to do kind of a rapid fire, um, you know, what are your recommendations, um, you know, two or three policy recommendations to improve how we include persons with disabilities in design choices, whether it's pedagogical design, um, instructional design, data design, user experience design in education. Um, and we'll close with this and then open it up to the, um, the panel discussion um, and um, questions. So, um, Vanessa, would you like to, to go first and give us perhaps two to three recommendations um, you'd like to see? Sure. Um, so I think that having the choice of being a remote or in-person is very important, um, especially for a disabled person, um, in addition to opt in or out of certain uh, types of technologies. Um, we also uh, need to ensure that IEPs are consistently adhered to, to avoid the disability tax. Um, and lastly, use more inclusive design in remote instruction, such as enabling live transcription on Zoom videos like we're doing here. Excellent. Thank you so much. Antonia, do you have two or three um, recommendations um, you'd like For to- For sure. Talk? I have many, so I will of take- Of course. <laughs> <laughs> so my first thing is fund more OER, which is open educational resources and pedagogy initiatives, um, which, you know, leads to kind of, uh, or feeds into education for all outside of the academy even, <laughs> which I also like. Um, I second Vanessa, um, definitely more real choice in the modalities. I wanna mention the high flex initiative at CUNY. It's not, it's in it's, you know, and it's, um, you know, it's in its beginning right now, but, uh, and it will improve, but that is basically a, a where students can choose in the same class to come to school, have face-to-face -face, um, um, instruction, uh, attend remotely, synchronously, or take the class completely online, all in this within the same class. So it's not different sections. I just wanted to mention that. So that's something that is going on in education right now. Um, then make professional development of instructors in universal design and inclusive teaching a priority and fund it properly, please. <laughs> I, I have no budget for this, unfortunately, for my faculty, so I'm, I'm advocating for that. And last but not least, definitely not least, uh, have more people with disabilities on your teams. This will definitely improve um, you know, many of the questions that we have discussed here because you will get that input. And so that's me. Fantastic. I really, um, I, I'm loving all of these. Um, they're, they're great. And you see, I'm clapping along um, with you guys. And last but not least, um, Victoria, wh what would be your two to three recommendations? I'm going to, I mean, some of them are kind of repeat because I'm uh, universal design should be, I mean, foremost everywhere. Like uh, as I think it was Antonia, you were saying in and out of the classroom, that should be everywhere. Um, I want also based on the, um, on within the, you know, the general, uh, the agreement uh, of UNESCO, the 2021, uh, when, I mean, governments, of course, it can be done through civil society demanding governments and the government should demand transparency from corporations. If we are going to incorporate to for educational purpose, any type of AI, any platform, learning management, we need to know what is the input because uh, I was also looking um, again, rereading the report, and it's not only that it may affect the quality or how engaging the, the education is, it may uh, present barriers to people with disabilities to get promoted in a school, like get access to scholarships, get access to courses that they want because the algorithms, they are made by humans, okay? 
the, the machines are trained by humans and humans have so many biases. Some of them as uh, you were mentioning before, I think it was Michelle, uh, that unintentional, it doesn't matter. It becomes intentional in the moment that you don't get input from the groups that are, we already know that they are being discriminated against. We cannot say, oh, I don't discriminate against people with disabilities, then everything is fine. We need, I think, I would say that would be the, the recommendation, top recommendation. We have to demand that governments uh, try to, you know, approve uh, laws, adopt laws, that demand transparency. Then also uh, people with disabilities should be part of uh, the decision-making data that, uh, I mean, you have to, you have to fund uh, research into how do these different types of um, AI, uh, these new technologies, how do they affect specifically these groups? And that again needs money. It's not only us as, uh, teachers or users, as in the case like uh, Vanessa, you were uh, telling about what are some of the difficulties that you encounter, is that we have to put all of this together, what works, what doesn't. And then I will say also, I had a, uh, an issue based on experience uh, with uh, management, with these different learning platforms with Blackboard, why, I mean, again, and this is a question I don't, I don't think anybody can answer it, is why do we have multiple, uh, uh, versions of it, that's a, a high learning curve. Why don't we have a unified model? So with students, I mean, if a student with disabilities has difficulty accessing these different learning modes or any student for that matter, why do we keep on insisting on them having to learn over and over again, where are the different uh, buttons that they have to push or where do they have to go to get the information? I have an issue with that, but I don't think there's a solution. So thank you so thank much. You. Thank you so, so, so much, um, Victoria. And just to wrap up um, and, and then we'll turn it over to questions. Um, if you have some questions, please put them in the chat. Um, so I want to just, you know, as we wrap up, um, you know, kind of what our panelists brought up is, is obviously we want to reduce the disability tax, um, you know, on our students. We want to promote um, universal design, and not because it's a you know kind of a, a you know a fly by night thing. This actually is incredibly well researched and is is in, as Victoria so so adroitly pointed out, is actually in. Um, you know, the international treaties and conventions that have come out on this. So it, it actually is, a it, when we say it's a best practice, it's actually, it actually literally is a best practice. Um, the other thing, um, you know, when we're talking about choice design, um, you know, and Antonia, you brought up like high flex as an option. I know, Vanessa, the course that, that you took with me, it essentially ended up being high flex. Regard, I mean, it was an in-person course, but we had students attending remotely, live, asynchronous. I mean, so it, it's it's certainly doable. And honestly, I think it's much more of, you know, a reality, you know, and, and it's it can be a very good way to accommodate students who also have temporary disabilities, you know, um, due to, you know, illness or something. So keep that in mind. The other thing, is um, that just the last point I'll make about the digital divide is, um, you know, and, and different ways to um, accommodate all sorts of um, learning styles and learning um, options is we also have to consider mobility um, because people are accessing content on mobile devices. Educational technology platforms are notoriously not good on mobile um, and um, you know mobile devices is is actually part of the digital divide right because you know but it can also be very enabling to people with mobility issues you know who can use mobile devices at you know in ways that you know maybe are prevented from sitting at a desktop um, but certainly um, you know making sure that you know the transparency um, around uh, you know, the corporations that are pushing, you know, a lot of the shiny new objects is critical um, in our role as, as educators, as we seek to promote um, inclusion um, and not ableism. So thank you. We have a question um, from David Shapiro at John Jay College. How can we be assured of the qualitative equivalence of OER course materials? Would it compose? Would it be better practice? Would it be better practice to make available both OER and intellectually protected course materials? Um, 
And then he has a second question um, around feedback from students and instructors about the effectiveness of high flex. Um, so advantages and disadvantages. I'm gonna start with the second question first. Um, and I'm gonna ask Vanessa to weigh in this high flex option that Ant Antonia brought up um, and, and David Shapiro is also addressing allows for what you called for is that kind of being able to attend a class in the way that you want or works for you. So it could be remote, it could be in person, it could be asynchronous. And I know you've had the experience of that because my course was essentially high flex. How was that advantageous to you as a student to have those options? Um, I think it was great. It kind of like um, wasn't as a lot of pressure, like, oh, I have to be in class on campus. Like I wasn't rushing, like, cause you know, things happen, you know, personal issues. Like I personally wasn't able to attend your class in person for a couple of weeks because of family matter. So I was just attending, you know, via Zoom, which was great. And, you know, it doesn't, you know, it, it definitely relieves the stress. Definitely is the, the big um, advantage to that. Um, I don't know if there's, there might be a disadvantage uh, possibly, not in that I can think of like off the top of my head. Um, maybe if you're not like, I don't know, technically advanced, maybe it's a disadvantage to you, but honestly, I think there's more of a, a positive um, side to it. Great, Th thank you so much for that. Um, you know, um, Antonia, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I know that there's, like you mentioned, some of the piloting of high flex um, at CUNY. Um, I know there's been, you know, some, there's some challenges to being able to just kind of switch over to that. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, so um, our, our office actually was part of the um, team that kind of uh, led the training for faculty um, across CUNY on HyFlex, at least like some of the cohorts. And so, you know, um, obviously it is a huge shift for an instructor to move into that realm because you have to um, sync like um, synchronously take care of at least two modalities when you're in the classroom because you have to always consider students who are um, attending remotely, right? At the same time that you are talking to uh, students in the classroom. So there are, um, um, and I think these are things that, you know, over time will work better also with technology, I hope. So that, for example, having students in the classroom that are present and uh, that are attending remotely work together or at least talk to each other in a way that, you know, is kind of smooth and doesn't feel awkward. The other thing is, um, uh, uh, instructors have always, you know, felt that their online students, fully online students kind of miss out a lot, you know, even if you can watch the recording, um, you know, it's kind of if there, by the way, also, there is another question about recording. So uh, CUNY is trying to figure out its policy on that because, you know, uh, recording a classroom session is not everyone's uh, thing, you know, student or instructor. I don't know how many instructors want to be recorded in my classroom, for example, right? So, um, and then also students, like how comfortable do students feel being recorded, you know, to talk freely in a classroom? So, you know, there are certain things that um, are still open questions and need to be figured out. And, you know, uh, uh, instructors having more experience with high flex will also get more comfortable. So we're getting also that kind of feedback that the comfort level, you know, is better. Um, and then, you know, I also want to say it's not everyone's thing. I mean, not all instructors are going to teach high flex, right? So um, I, I just want to also say I don't think this is necessarily the future for all education, but you know it works for certain topics for certain instructors for certain students, uh, it works really well. And what students have definitely said is the flexibility of like saying I'm not feeling it today if I'm not feeling well or I'm not feeling like a company today and I can attend the class remotely right. Or even, you know, I have something, I have childcare duties and I'm gonna do the um, online uh, version this week is definitely a plus. So Vanessa, I, I agree with you that we definitely have gotten that feedback. But I feel like this is a new mode and it's still being developed. And, you know, even in the education realm, it's, it's still a pretty new kind of development. And, you know, I don't know, it's still being um, assessed oh, <laughs> and approved. Absolutely. I think there's two key points you brought up there is one is instructor comfort with this. And, and 
um, for me, I mean, my classes, even though they're not advertised as high flex, actually tend to be um, high flex um, re regardless, because it's just, I mean, I've had students actually attend um, on an iPad and, and, you know, they're, they're, so they're actually given, the iPad is given to a different student each week, so like kind of yeah. like a Tamagotchi, you know, um, and, uh, but that's also because, um, you know, I also come from a very different background. You know, I have a military and industry experience um, that I bring to my academic experience. So this high flex that we discuss in education is actually not, it, it's pretty common in other sectors, right? So some of it, some instructors may be more comfortable. The other thing you brought up is ensuring that the assignments, again, not just how do we push content out, but how do we create assignments that would integrate students who are attending in various modalities? So, you know, um, I'm kind of like, I like to emphasize that because I know that there's so much focus on pushing content. I want to turn um, the other aspect of David's question over to Victoria. So using, let's say, open educational resources, um, and I know you've done some of this and some of your, um, you've done some great assignment design, especially around food justice. Um, so how do we, you know, kind of, um, you know, um, assure that, I mean, he, he phrased it in terms of the, the qualitative equivalence of open resources as well as, as copyrighted ones. Can you talk to your experience on that? Okay, I'm going to talk about it. I have had um, the experience of um, providing my students with uh, free uh, textbooks in one of my courses. It's the International Human Rights uh, Law and Justice and since at least 2016. And what I did was um, I do my, I compile um, documents from the UN which are open to, for my use, and I got a reader. So I have um, close to 300 pages of a reader. I uh, initiate every uh, chapter, every module. It has uh, my own words, like if I were talking to the students, so sometimes it's two paragraphs, sometimes it's one paragraph. And I will tell you after going through a lot of textbooks, some of them that I like because they were suitable for me, but they were not suitable for my students. I have a different background and uh, teaching is not the same and education is not the same everywhere. Um, I basically consider that my reader is much more, uh, has better quality than whatever is out there to teach for the purpose that I want, which is very legal, but also with, um, assignments and with uh, not every student likes it some of them complain oh you only have a pile of documents i'm like well that's what i'm teaching and that's why i go to class and i explain it then later on to you and that costs a student zero the first year i implemented in a summer uh, course it was a five week and i was like how am i going to teach all of this in five weeks I did the module with modules i took my students there were like 20 of them uh, the the department administrative assistant got us copies for everybody and we everybody put them on folders and they got their, their textbook the first day of classes free of any charges and everything high quality i will tell you that if they knew everything that was in that reader they will be set for life on on the basics of human rights the other issue is that about copyright i use for my american government classes this year i'm not teaching it i my class was canceled and um, I'm using uh, a reader that is an open uh, access. The copyright doesn't disappear. It depends, there are different types of copyright. It's uh, the person that has the, so the license to Creative Commons, they will decide. So sometimes uh, it's convenient for them. They are still uh, being paid uh, by uh, in different ways. So for some people, that's a good way of doing it. And sometimes it's not, but some people prefer it that way. The quality is, uh, I did before I adopted the book, the textbook for American government, I read the book. I also did a critique. I sent information. I'm talking more than 20 pages on what I thought was missing, what was not okay. And it was as good as any other book I have had. The difference is that my students can have access to it since day one. They be for free and the students that are in any program by, and I think that's a good, um, that's why it's good to promote this, uh, this 
uh, open, uh, you know, and free of charge uh, books and courses. Uh, the students that were in some programs, uh, they will get a hard copy they wanted to for free. Find it like a, which was- so, uh a fantastic, Victoria. Um, we're coming up on the end of our um, session, so I apologize for, um, you know, uh, uh, stepping in there. But I want to uh, kind of wrap that up. Um, is you know, I think that, um, you know, some of the things that Victoria highlighted, you know, is the zero cost, um, which is also contributes to universal design because the financial aspects of online learning you know, including, you know, the broadband, the hardware, the software necessary can, um, you know, be especially difficult for students with disabilities who tend to face significant financial challenges because of the, the severe employment uh, discrimination against persons with disabilities. So right away, the zero cost. And I think um, uh, to David's point, Victoria did a, an excellent job of describing the role of the professor as curator, right? So there is a lot of open material out there and part of the value that the professor brings is that kind of curatorial um, quality control. So um, I do want to um, um, thank our panelists, um, um, Vanessa, Victoria and Antonia um, for a really a fascinating um, discussion. Your perspectives, knowledge and experience were incredibly valuable. Um, and I really appreciate the time you took in the preparation um, for this and um, being such um, excellent um, ambassadors um, in the world of artificial intelligence and global education. This is actually, you know, this is one of these emerging um, topics. And so I really appreciate um, your commitment to bringing this discussion to light, especially um, you know, given the, the importance of this um, on the international stage. Um, thank you to the Teaching and Learning Center for um, sponsoring this and to all of our attendees. There was a question um, about whether the chat will be saved um, because the one of the attendees wanted the, the resources. Um, so I, I will let the Teaching and Learning Center um, team address that. Um, Gina, I'll turn it over to you uh, for last remarks. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Vanessa, Antonia, Victoria. It is always good to be in a room with amazing people and those of you who have attended. Yes, we are saving the recording. We'll edit and hopefully have it ready to share next week. We'll be saving the transcript. We'll be saving the chat and we'll try to put together a package for everyone and send you a link that you can use, okay? This conversation definitely needs to continue. Some good points were raised excellent context. And I'm holding back from my manifesto on how we need to completely transform the ways we approach education, but wait for it. Maybe we'll do that one in May. Have a wonderful rest of the day, everyone. Be good to yourselves. And thanks again.